Shortcuts, Russ. Shortcuts. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the movie I couldn't remember last week that Robert Altman directed. Now I remember. Yeah, That's I, right. I, it's dry, It's been driving me crazy all week, and I had to get that off my chest. I'm glad you got it <laughs> off your chest. So see that movie, everybody, if you haven't seen it. It's really Shortcuts. good. Shortcuts. Well, welcome to episode two of Adult Music, your podcast for music for the mature mind. With the mature mind. The mature mind. Not too mature, though. I think we're the mature <laughs> enough. Anyway, welcome anyone, everyone, to this second installment. Uh, last time in the first episode, we just sort of kicked things off without much preparation, uh, brainstorming, and we had a good time. And uh, after we finished, actually, we uh, followed up with a couple of great 450-gram uh, uh, grass-fed steaks uh, from oh, New that Zealand. Good. That was very yeah. good. And a bottle yeah. of wine. And uh, there's no better way to uh, finish off doing anything. Yeah, other now than my that. vegetarian friends are going to be all upset that you said that, but... You know. Well, this is not a vegan-friendly podcast. Um, nothing against the uh, vegans. It's more meat for me. Vegans are welcome, though. Yes, certainly okay. welcome. Just, um, just not the dinner. <laughs> but uh, a few things happened uh, before and after that. Actually, um, when we were uh, brainstorming this idea, we knew we would need a theme. And mm. uh, you said, uh, why don't you write it? And yeah. uh, actually, yeah, we, have an we, original had, theme. Uh, we had recorded the first uh, episode before uh, I had thought about the theme. And of course, if someone says, write something, then you have the pressure of, you know, what do I do? Uh, but anyway, I sat down at the piano and just started uh, uh, jamming along a little bass line. And then uh, eventually, uh, after uh, thinking of some things, uh, I came up with uh, some ideas to put together to the theme you hear introducing, the adult music podcast theme. And mm. so that was uh, composed and uh, performed by uh, yours truly, Russ. So uh, right. no yeah, copyright fantastic. infringements there. It may sound like several other things that I've heard, but doesn't everything. Uh, maybe it reminds me a bit of something Youssef Latif uh, maybe uh, hinted mm. at. But uh, in any case... That's yeah. out there. And, um, and yeah, I after... also notice that it, it incorporates the tritone, a.k.a. Yes. the knowing devil's that I... chord. Yes, knowing that yeah. um, we were we would soon be speaking and the intro would be fading out, uh, mm. I wanted to do something interesting. Uh, so uh, along with uh, being based on nine, nine chords, uh, then uh, we, normally in like a blues progression, you'll sometimes when you come back to the root, there's a tritone substitution, but in this case, I didn't want to give the uh, five chord too soon, so you have to wait for it. And uh, anyway, mm -hmm. people might be saying, what is he talking about? Uh, anyway, you can hear that just before we uh, come in and then at the end of the podcast, if you'll be so kind as to stay around to the end. Um, yeah, so that's there and it's our own original music. And yeah, uh, I think we are it the, the we're one of good. the very few podcasts that have our own original music. That's fact. right. That's yeah. right. And um, the other sad thing, I think it was the day after, is we uh, found out a great loss to the uh, uh, world yeah, of music news this week, yeah. with the passing of uh, Chick Corea. All right. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, who was, uh, I guess in some ways you could, you could say he was the greatest living uh, jazz pianist. I mean, greatest is a well, loaded comment, but uh, as Keith far as... Jarrett. I think of Keith Jarrett, too. Yeah, but, no, but, no, but when you think of... different, but, you know. Yeah, the, the innovation and different types mm. of music with... Uh, I mean, he played with Miles Davis and then... Yeah, he was he was um, certainly a giant, though, one of, yeah, one giant, of the best out um, there. Yeah. And then he was involved in the whole you know, fusion uh, thing. And then... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and I return I love to his, forever. Yeah, Stanley he's playing Clark, yeah. Uh, with uh, a good friend Stanley of mine. Jordan, sorry, I get that wrong. <laughs> um, uh, we used to listen to uh, him as a sideman with Blue Mitchell uh, yeah. and other albums. Uh, and then the amazing thing is, I mean, the last few years he was so prolific, and uh, you know, in the from 2010 onward, he's done so much great music. And of course, he's uh, nominated for a, a Grammy Award this year, and so we'll be talking about him again in the upcoming episode where we discuss the Grammy nominees and our ideas about that. So. Yeah, we should, we, should, we should talk a little bit about that. Um, the Grammys are coming up on March 14th, and there's an entire section of the Grammys that isn't televised that 
I, I would be willing to bet that most people don't even know about. Um, the, you know, the Jazz Grammys and the Classical Grammys, and there are some others too. And I was watching these last year when they did it, and it's just they just give them out. You know, it's it's kind of not with no fanfare. You get a few performances in there, but they just hand out these statues. Hey, congratulations! Get out of here. <laughs> you know, it's sort of. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's not as drawn out. I actually enjoyed it a lot more than the regular Grammys, which has lots of performances and a lot of kind of what I felt was I don't know. It's, I just find it very unenjoyable in general. I'm a very anti awards kind of person, um, just because, yeah. especially like um, acting awards. Who cares? You know, you've got your your paycheck and it's a big thing. And I'm I'm usually disappointed with the selections for music awards anyway. Um, but you know, it can be a launching board to, uh, look, I'm, I'm not as uh, disappointed with this year's nominees as I have been in the past. So, well, know. we'll have a lot to say about both the jazz and classical Grammys. I, I like both like, and don't like it yeah. for, you know, we'll get, we'll kind of parse that. Yeah, we'll, we, get uh, there. we'll get, get there. We'll get to it. Yeah. There. Um, okay. So yeah, Chick Corea, I kind of felt that as a, as quite a loss, actually. I was kind yeah. of, uh. Big fan. I've been re really been enjoying the uh, records he's been making, in the, especially in the 2010s. Um, he, he was very prolific right up until the end. Uh, he did those two uh, trilogy records with um, uh, Christian Brian McBride Blade and Brian Blade. And Christian yeah. McBride. Those are my favorite. I actually prefer those yeah. to the... Um, to the what is it my spanish heart um yeah, this, which, the antidote with the spanish heart band he was right. the one he did is that it? It? Okay, i think it was yeah. 2018 I, I, okay but i just felt that the, the, uh, around that time the communication and interplay on those two uh trio albums is phenomenal uh you you can just it, you can sense the communication and the the way that they're integrated it's something really special on those um so those i i enjoy uh often uh, yeah. By the way, uh, the bassist Stanley Clark was in Return to Forever. That's I gotta right. I got to get my, my Clarks and my Jordans, you know, <laughs> Clarks and sorted Jordans. out. Yes. Stanley Jordan was the, uh, who was he? He was the guy who played the, he tapped the guitar, right? Yeah, that's that was, right. Yeah, on yeah, Blue okay, Note yeah. back in the 80s. And, uh, all right. Yeah, it's what all what coming back to, to me now. See, we're getting yes. old. We don't remember we're this stuff. Old. Yes, music <laughs> for the mature mind, as we said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for the mature mind. Right. For the, for the... <laughs> for the eroding mind, the decaying that's mind. Right. That's right. <laughs> Just to keep it active. Keep it active. Speaking of okay. active minds, uh, this might be an yeah. uh, opportune minute, uh, minute to mention uh, a book. Yes. Yes. Uh, we, not, we, well, not, Russ talked about his original composition. Yes, I'm going to talk about... Not adult music, but rather extreme ex music. Extreme music, yes. That's right. Uh, this is a book you can buy at Amazon. It's a novel. And I am the author, and you could help me out a lot if you uh, buy a copy and edify your mind by reading it. It's actually very funny. Yes, as well it is. as kind of presenting a few uh, interesting thoughts about classical music. It takes place in the classical music world. Uh, the funny thing is, I've got this book on Amazon, and I, I get a lot of, like, sort of, um, you know, hits on it. Uh, mostly from Russia, oddly. I don't know. Russians, I guess, read a lot of English books. I guess extreme and music and Russia, those words could go Yeah, together. but you know, extreme music kind of, the title sort of is used in heavy metal, like a kind of extreme metal. Oh, right. And I think when people see it, they think, oh, this is a book about metal. And then they see the cover and they start reading it. I think they're inevitably disappointed. But, um, you know, it's just like they may it, be have to know, clicking on a pink font with adult music. Um, or listening to one of the albums we're going to discuss today. That's right. Because uh, there's something I yeah you know, I'll mention this when when this when this album comes up. Anyway, okay. we'll put the we'll put the Amazon link to uh, your book uh, in the notes to this podcast, and I can recommend it as an early reader before you had completely published it. Uh, yeah. Anyone who has experience, uh, especially in classical music or conservatory uh, setting, uh, I guess every art form has its own type of pretentiousness which is associated with it and um you dismantle that in a very humorous <laughs> way and yeah. uh it's quite enjoyable uh to go through uh the different episodes of the book and anyone from a musical background or with musical experience i think would get the dark humor in it and uh, have a good time with the book and yeah, so my I, I, my complete endorsement for an enjoyable thanks. read with this book. I really don't like what postmodernism, postmodern thought is doing to the world, but I guess I'm a postmodernist after all. After all, that's right. <laughs> at, least, at least in my art. You've deconstructed <laughs> the society of 
classical music with this book. Well, the thing is what struck me, it's the, the basic idea of the book is it's about a composer who, um, he, his music has the, the power to kind of destroy things basically, I yes. guess what it caused that it's dangerous to play. It's sort of like extreme sports. That's where I got the idea from right. where you're taking your life in your hands by playing this music. I thought it was a funny idea, but the, the composer whose name is Alberto Narcisi, um, is, um, you know, for narciss narcissist, right? But uh, his uh, in the nineteenth century, a lot of composers had these massive egos, you know. And I always found that rather funny. I, I, I imagine they would have been unbearable to be around. But I certainly like reading about them. Um, by the way, anyone out there, if you're interested in reading a, a class, a, a biography of a classical composer, read uh, the Hector Berlioz's autobiography. It's unintentionally hilarious it's re it's really over the top he talks about things like what it was like in his mother's womb <laughs> he remembers that somehow and he also remembers how his mother felt when he was born you know in the book he explains how he's going to be a medical student he was horrified by that and it's just it's really great it's a very entertaining read so even if he's not your favorite composer this will be your favorite composer autobiography it's really great i recommend it Oh, sounds kind of interesting. I haven't checked that out, yeah. but yeah, yeah. take a look at that. Yeah, so, so um, are any. that's uh, yeah some things uh, going on before uh, last week and this podcast now. And so uh, this week we've got uh, six selections that we've been listening to uh, to talk about. Yeah, six selections, by the way, that you're not going to hear snippets of in this particular um, episode. We should we should talk about that a little bit because people are going to listen to this music podcast and they're not going to hear any music. Why That's is right. that? Well, <laughs> yes, uh, we we were wondering about how uh, we could include uh, samples from the music that we talk about. I mean, other than the links that we provide, um, but uh, we particularly uh, in a timely manner, uh, sort of. Uh, warned by the uh, case of uh, Rick Beato, the YouTuber, who has yeah. done a lot of uh, wonderful musical education uh, types of videos, uh, What Makes This Song Great, and other yeah, things. I enjoy those myself. Who, uh, in the past, has been hit with copyright infringements, uh, which were sort of minor things that resulted in his videos being uh, demonetized, uh, which he never protested. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, fine, fair enough, which would, I guess the result was it turned any revenue that he made off from those videos over to the original artist, which he mm. accepted. I mean, although he's clearly making an income from those uh, videos, and rightly so. But recently he was hit with uh, copyright strikes, which mm -hmm. could result in his whole channel being removed. And they yeah. happen to be uh, rather by artists that uh, probably no one is really listening to much anymore. anymore. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and he's it, on YouTube, so he does video. We're not yeah. doing video, at least not yet. You know, maybe and he's, one day. Uh, he's introducing these songs probably to uh, new generations, millennials and Generation Z, who probably mm -hmm. thought uh, that's not so great. And he was showing them, you know, how these songs were made. And um, so I started to look up uh, some of the rules for using music and podcasts or YouTube or whatnot. And they're really uh, extremely strict. Uh, I had thought uh, there's the fair use claim, which basically yeah. doesn't hold any water. Uh, less than 30 seconds. Uh, no, there's no real time limit. Uh, basically, without contacting uh, the rights holder or publisher and uh, establishing some type of payment for using that you are not allowed to uh, play any copyrighted material uh, in your uh, podcast which uh, is quite uh, quite unfortunate because uh, if you're doing something like this where we're mainly introducing or recommending things you should uh, listen to yeah and that um, you've inevitably not most of the in most cases not heard and certainly probably haven't heard any of these newer interpretations exactly. if it's a famous work you know exactly so you know we're playing mm -hmm. it safe for now but uh, we may see what we can get away with uh, I think probably YouTube the uh, guidelines and the uh, policing of such a thing is much more strict than uh, what yeah. we're doing here um, and I, yeah. I think too on YouTube uh, I know that for checking for uh, profanity or other sort of uh, inflammatory things is limited mainly to the first 30 minutes 
of right. uh, a broadcast. Um, but if anyone's saying, why don't they play the songs they're talking about? Uh, that's the reason why. And since we are getting just getting off the ground here, we wanted to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we weren't uh, violating any uh, copyright rules. Uh, from right. The beginning. We, we will experiment eventually and probably try yes. to include some music and see what happens. But we want to get a few episodes up first that won't be taken down. <laughs> that's you know, right. So, because yeah. of any kind of copyright rules, just exactly. so you have something to listen to so people – you know, that are right. listening to us can you know go back and you know we will provide right. links to all, to all the music so you can hear it. You really should hear it because it, music is notoriously hard to describe if you haven't heard it before. You know, and especially yes. the music we're going to be talking about today, most of it's very unfamiliar. That's right. Yeah. Speaking of unfamiliar music, why don't we uh, just launch right into that now? Yeah, let's jump in. And uh, this first one is uh, my pick, uh, yeah. which I happened upon by chance. By chance to say that um, uh, in the past year, I've been listening occasionally to lute music, um, just I because music, yeah. I find it really soothing and I like the sound. Yeah. And one of the um, uh, contemporary uh, lute players who uh, plays a lot of uh, wonderful music is Thomas Dunford, hmm. and. Yeah. Uh, so he's come out with a collaboration album in this came out at the end of last year, but I didn't uh, find it released until uh, January called The Mad Lover. And his uh, compatriot here is uh, has a name that we are trying to decide how to pronounce. I think you did it better than I did. Uh, ah, do you want to give it a shot there? Yeah, I don't have it in front of me. I have to. <laughs> I heard I heard this album on. Uh... In streaming too, I should mention we we use we both use Deezer by the way to yes. uh, to stream music uh, when we're when we're listening to new music that we don't have already. So yeah. uh, Deezer, if you're out there, you might want to sponsor us. Yes, yeah, sponsor <laughs> us. We love your we, sound quality, you. and you have yeah. a nice catalog. And um, uh, yes, everything good to say about Deezer. Anyway, uh, yeah. how how okay. do we say his name? So you Thomas Dunford team. and this guy, the magnificently named violinist. Theatim Langlois de Swart. That's it. There you go. Wow. A long name that's hard to say. Um, Wouldn't it be great if your name, think about that, if your name was Theatim Langlois de Swart. De Swart, you know, yes. I think that would have resulted in a lot of beatings on the playground when we were children, but it would have been worth it to go through adulthood with a name like that, I think. Yes. What do you think? De Swart. Even if it was just something <laughs> of De Swart, I would be, have been happy, yes. I like Theatim. Um, That's a good name. Theatim anyway, Langlois. So, so this is a uh, duo of... Um, yeah of lute and violin which mm -hmm. uh works really well together and uh their sort of um interplay is uh, extremely natural and uh nice and the contents are mainly uh 17th century compositions by uh english composers and also italian composers who were at the time in uh, england uh, making their living. So we have uh, Eccles, John Eccles, The Mad mm -hmm. Lover's Suite, uh, which the recording begins with. And uh, this hooked me right away because of the sort of romantic style of uh, the compositions. And the, 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 the piece starts in a minor key, and then it will just suddenly switch into a major key uh, sort of portion and then go back to minor uh, in a way that uh, once you get later into Baroque music doesn't happen in the same sort of way. Uh, so there's a lot of surprises in uh, changes with uh, tempos and uh, sort of tonalities that are very uh, refreshing and surprising as you're listening to uh, the pieces. And their sort of interplay is so natural, uh, like they've been playing together for uh, longer than I believe they have. And uh, other uh, compositions, we have uh, Purcell, uh, English composer. There's actually one piece uh, that's uh, by Dunford, an original competition, uh, composition. And then we have uh, two uh, Italians, uh, Matthias the Elder and also the Younger and another uh, Purcell uh, prelude piece. And uh, it's just a lovely combination of these two instruments. They really blend together well. And the music is very um, sort of, uh, when I say romantic, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, the romantic period, but uh, it's very uh, 
sort of a playful and also passionate at the same time. And it really yeah. creates a nice mood. And so whenever I listen to it, it really relaxes me. And uh, uh, I, I think, wow, why aren't there more sort of lute and violin com combinations out there? Yeah, it's really pretty. I found this record, you said romantic. I, I, the word that came to me was contemplative. It's actually a pretty mm -hmm. quiet record. Beautiful tone. Uh, nothing, is, nothing is really forced. The violin plays in a really sort of gentle tone. Nothing fiery. No, no, really no. Throughout. But he has a very warm tone as a player. It's very warm, yeah. Yes. It's, it's relaxing. It's, I thought of it as... Um, I, I, when I listen to Baroque music, I tend to listen to it in the morning, as was the case with this album. I had it on... Um, in the right. morning when I was, you know, getting up. And it, it's really just ideal. It just suits the mood of that time. Um, long ago, I got into the habit of listening to uh, Baroque music in the morning. I worked on a radio show called Morning Baroque, and it just became a habit for me. It just sets the day off um, on the right, you know, with the right mood. And right. Uh, I've been doing that ever since. And this was an ideal sort of a companion to that. I also want to mention, this is a very long album. It's about 80 minutes long. Yes. And uh, the tone of it, you know, if if you're going to listen to the you know, the surprising changes in major and minor, you you have to be listening really closely because um the whole um you could actually just have this on in the background and just have it be this sort of pleasant sort of eighty minute um, contemplative uh, musical you know sound going on while you. You know, drink your coffee or and get ready for your day, I guess. Or whenever you listen, you can listen to it late at night too. Um, but uh, it's 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 really ideal for that. I think I lost my uh, train of thought there somehow. Hmm. No, I okay. agree. I, I I often yeah. listen to Baroque music in the morning, and in general, I find it one of the music styles, one of the few that I can uh, have as a background music because of the logical structure. Uh, it helps me actually focus so I can do other work while I listen to this style of music. But I found myself surprised often with yeah. um, the directions this uh, recording went. And so I pulled away from my work so that I could focus on what was actually happening. So it, it sort of has that extra little element of intrigue. Uh, right. in the compositions and and you know I find it quite refreshing I've listened to it a few times yeah. and um, you know just as something that I clicked on by chance knowing uh, the lute players previous recordings uh, I thought th yeah, there's really something uh, special uh, in this recording so I highly recommend it for um, yeah. yeah people who are interested in Baroque music um, but something that's a little just bit different contemplative yeah, yeah, contemplative to... yeah it's very good yeah, I like this a lot. This is something I'll go back to again and again all year. I just know it. Yeah, it's um, really nice. It's, this, this is a, I've got the CD on order. It will be on my shelf oh, one day. Excellent. I liked it a lot. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Fantastic. All right. Moving on. We're going to, we're going to stick to classical music. I think what we're going to do is do a classical music in the beginning and then save uh, jazz for the later part. Just in case you want to tune in. Right. So you know where your favorite genre is. We hope you'll listen to the whole, the whole, uh, podcast um our next pick here huh, i'm losing my uh sound is um an album by uh giovanni antonini and il giardino armonico an italian group it's a lot of italians today in this um this particular yes. um, italians podcast. and duos we have lots and duos of italians too, yeah. and duos yes yeah there's gonna be another duo okay this is um the ninth volume in giovanni antonini's Haydn 2032 project. Now, in that project, um, 2032 is going to be the, um, what is it, 300th? Yeah. Uh, anniversary of uh, Joseph Haydn's birth. And mm. uh, they want to record all of his 104, I believe, or it's around that number, symphonies uh, that he composed That's a in lot his of lifetime. That That's is a lot. lot of symphonies. Well, he had a he had a full-time job. Lucky him. Most composers uh, don't get that. Uh, helps when you're getting thing. paid, yes. Yeah, it helps when you're getting paid and you're being uh, driven to uh, write something every week. Johann Sebastian Bach had the same situation, except that he wasn't really being paid much. He was working for the the church, whereas um, uh, Haydn was working for a very rich family, the Esterhaza family in uh, Austria. Well, where would it have been then? Vienna, I guess. Right. Okay. Anyway, this one, this number, the, each of these has a um, a nickname, and uh, this particular volume is called Ladio, which means uh, the goodbye, and uh, the name is taken after um, uh, Haydn's farewell 
Symphony, and that is which is on this uh, album. Now it's called the Farewell Symphony for an interesting reason. Um, there are different stories about why it has that name, but basically what happens is at the end of the symphony, generally a classical symphony, someone like uh, something written by Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven in that e era, um, will have four movements. The first one will be in sonata form. Uh, the second one will be song-like and um, okay, and it'll have like a, a melody usually. This is just general. I mean, the exciting thing about this kind of music is the, uh, you know, the the way they differentiate these uh, things the great composers do. The third uh, movement is generally some kind of a dance um, movement, like a menuet. And then the fourth movement kind of tries to bring everything together into some thing that, um, and it's usually pretty fast and exciting. But in this case, the in the um, the uh, Farewell Symphony, um, about in the middle of the fourth movement, the, the music suddenly gets very slow. And uh, instruments in the orchestra slowly drop out until there's only they're only again a, I guess a duo at the end there might be more than two players but I think they're down to only two players at the end and the two players end the symphony now the idea the story goes this is one of the three stories presented in the booklet was that um, the prince Esther Hazel was keeping the um, uh, the orchestra Haydn's orchestra at the uh, estate uh, longer than usual for the summer. Now these musicians had families to go home to, and uh, they w they wanted to get home to the family. So Haydn, who was uh, who all the musicians loved, he was um, he was always on their side, and he was apparently a great guy. Incidentally, a little trivia thing for you: if if I could meet any composer who ever lived, uh, it would probably be Haydn. He just seems like a genuinely nice guy, and he had a good sense of humor too. Uh, I heard he was hard about... to find, though. You know, what, what was that? He was hard to find. Because he was always he was hiding. hiding oh, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> we won't be doing stand-up soon. Anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, um, the story was that Haydn wrote this, um, this ending in so that each musician, when they finished their part, they could uh, they 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 all had uh, candles illuminating their scores. And they would put out their candle, and leave the stage one by one, and it was said that this was a a hint to the prince that uh, the musicians wanted to go home. All right, so he, and he apparently got the hint and sent them home. That's one of the the stories. There are others too about why it ends in that unusual way. Okay, anyway, um, this series has actually been pretty good. There's um the best one. So far is um, volume four, and um, Antonin, his work, in this case, he's with Il Giardino Armonico, but he's also um, conducted a few other uh, orchestras in the series. He's not just sticking with this uh, one group, and that's actually a good thing. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, he's also with the Camera Orchestra Basel, and uh, the best, in my, in my opinion, the best uh in this story, in this series, is volume four called Il Distratto. So look that up on your, um, uh, on Deezer. your, um, yeah, your Deezer there. Okay, your, your streaming <laughs> or your preferred site. streaming platform. Your, or your preferred streaming platform, right. Uh, this one was beautifully recorded and the pacing was wonderful. Now, in this, um, ninth edition, um, boy, these, these, these symphonies, these classical symphonies are like, driven really hard they're, they're very unusually performed usually we think of Haydn, we think of elegance and wit. yes that's okay? what i would say um yeah have, compared to other Haydn recordings i noticed the the tempos are um i, I don't want to say they're just fast but they're they're kind of um they seem on the edge of where where it would be appropriate to uh, have them in in terms of fast tempo, um, but they're also played rather aggressively, uh, in a yeah. good way. And so I, I found them very intense and satisfying uh, to listen yeah. to, especially well the uh, the first the thirty uh, symphony thirty five and then the centerpiece yeah. the forty five. Not so much with the uh, final piece the uh, uh, number fifteen in D major. Yeah, that, that was a that little more a little yeah. more what I. I'm used to with uh, Haydn uh, symphony recordings, but the first two I found um, yet to be, you know, quite intense, and uh, yeah. so they they sort of had a bigger impact on me than uh, normal, you know, Haydn uh, recordings that I have of these. Yeah, if you could think of the uh, the music or the symphonies themselves as a horse, it's almost like the uh, the musicians should just 
you know, riding this horse into the ground, you know, as hard as it can go. Right. You know, um, these came across as um, athletic. The playing is very athletic and uh, aggressive. Okay. It's it's a really different take on Haydn. Worth hearing, but I, I don't know. I thought this was a little too much for me. I, I, mm -hmm. I'd really prefer this to be a little um, slowed down. I do love Giovanni Antonini and Il Giardino Armonico. They're great. Um, they're a great ensemble, and they're they're really fantastic with shaping melody, especially. Yeah. Um, lately, though, they've been doing this quite a lot. Um, they have. Um, there was recently a um, recording with uh, the violinist Patricia Patricia Kopachinskaya, who we're going to talk about later too, um, called "What's Next, Vivaldi," and they sort of did the same thing. They played the these very familiar like Vivaldi type, well, these Vivaldi works uh, with this really unbelievable energy okay and mm -hmm. um and speed um and then um antonini himself recorded a uh an album telemon recorder concertos not not concertos maybe uh chamber works th where he really uh showed his incredible um virtuosic ability on the uh, recorder but again very fast tempos tone was always really beautiful it's it's pretty mm -hmm. remarkable to listen to but again very aggressive playing so uh the, the recording quality the, on let this let the is, listener beware is quite good though um which i, I believe they're using period instruments are, are they not on this album? i'm sure they are yeah um but um it, it doesn't sound you know some period instrument I, I mean that's been a thing for a while now and sometimes you think oh well <laughs> Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. But here, um, it, it's uh, to a good effect, and the recording quality is uh, quite good as well. Um, so I was really drawn in to the whole performance uh, yeah. uh, as a whole. There's a vocal uh, piece, too, yeah, also yeah. separating them. I want to talk about, that, too, yeah. that each of these um, albums in the, the Haydn 2032 here series has this little... Uh, uh, musical bonbon in it, I guess you could say. Um, just some surprise work by uh, an unknown composer, or sometimes even a known composer like Mozart, and or some vocal work or some so recitativo. Recitativo. Yeah. Now in this yeah. case, um, it's a uh, a recitative and is it an aria too? I, I got my book. Oh uh, yes, here. there's an aria to... there also. Yeah. Uh, now this was a this was a very pleasant surprise because the uh, soprano is uh, the French soprano Sandrine Piau. Yes. And I've got a few of her records, and man, th this this woman's voice, she she really when she she went for those high notes for the climaxes, just this beautiful ring, big ringing tone. It was really exciting to listen to. I really like that performance, probably the best on this disc. So uh, it's it's uh. worth listening to for that. You, know, you can just seek that those tracks out too on your streaming service. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, Berenice, what what is this called? Um, Scena di Berenice, okay, which is apparently an opera or cantata that Haydn wrote. I'm unfamiliar with it, but there you go. I thought that was the highlight of the disc. Really, I really enjoyed her singing a lot. Yeah, I enjoyed it more than I usually uh, do. Not yeah. being much of a uh, classical vocal person, uh, I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll skip over this uh, part, but. I actually enjoyed it more than I expected that I would, and it, it does. Um, you know, if you after you've listened to uh, two symphonies in a row, uh, you know, it sort of cleanses the the listening palate a little bit. Uh, so, uh, even though you know, you're having a vocal work between the uh, orchestrations, um, yeah. might seem, hmm, why did they do that? But in this case, no, I I enjoyed that as well. Um, it's it's sort of, funny. Cleanses the listening palate. You know, it's it's really funny because when I talk about music, it, it, music is hard to describe. So, and I find myself like with that word often to, comparing it to food. I don't well, know what yeah. it is. I, you can be lulled into yeah. you know, music demands attention, but uh, when you've listened to uh, something, and then you, you know you listen to something in the same format. You know that's gone through yeah. the same cycle. Uh, naturally, your attention wanes, and so if you have yeah. something contrasting uh, to that, um, it sort of yeah. you know, woke me up again when the voice came in. And then right. I thought, oh, am I just going to want to get to that last symphony? But no, uh, I was drawn into that. And then you know, I was when when I finally listened to the fifteenth uh, yeah. at the end, I was right. once again. Uh, back to my concentration for that so yeah i think it works in terms of the uh organization of the program 
Yeah, so give this a listen, everybody. It's really yeah. uh, it's it's a little unusual for Haydn because of the the aggressive, not just the speed, but the aggressiveness, the the hardness that yes, the music yeah. is played with. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. There's a lot of Indeed. intensity there. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of, by the way, music and food. I always, I often think food. When we when we learn about a foreign culture, the best entry, you know, the most appealing entry to a foreign culture for most people, for I guess for everybody really, is food. You kind of food like and booze. Food That's first. the way I go. Yes. Yeah. And then I guess the next thing would be music because if you're going to go beyond that, like movies or books, that then you're getting into language and you have to learn a foreign language. Okay, but so music is usually the next thing. But music, it's it's really funny. You, you have to do some work to like music sometimes, especially from a foreign culture. You don't really understand what's happening in it. That's right. Um, so you know, I, know. I guess a lot of people are stuck at food. So, what, yeah, I think there are levels to getting into a foreign culture. You start with the food. You get the food level, the music level. Did you get to the literature level? I don't know. I don't. Know. That's my idea. Anyway, I'll just stay with go. the food and the booze, and then stay with um, the food. Then I can maybe, yeah. Yeah. Listen yeah. while I read, and maybe we'll go deeper. I like some good world cuisine myself. Okay. The next the next choice, my next rather controversial choice. I don't know. It's not controversial. It's um, what we – I don't know. We, we, we had a lot – we did a lot of thinking about this, this next choice. Now, I had mentioned um, that Il Giardino Armonico had recorded um, – and Giovanni Antonini had recorded an album with the violinist Patricia Kopachinskaya. Uh, who also calls – she's a Moldovan violinist. She's uh, very short, and she has this gigantic tone. Again, a real way with melody. I like her a lot. So I tend to listen to everything that she puts out. And uh, she's put out a record uh, just this year on the Alpha label with uh, Sol Gabetta, who is a well-known uh, cellist okay, from Argentina. And uh, with Camerata Burn, conducted by – Francisco Cole, the Spanish conductor and composer, as it turns out. Okay, and uh, their most th this release was called Plaisir Illumine Illumine. Okay, as an accent there, Plaisir Illumine. Okay, it's a it's a program of 20th century composers and one 21st century composer. The conductor has one of his works on this too. So I went right for it. I said, "Oh, exciting!" Okay. Anyway. Uh, the first work, Sandor Veres, uh, he's a Hungarian composer, uh, lived in the 20th century, a little younger than uh, Bartok and Kodai, the, the two really famous Hungarian composers from that century. Uh, Musica Concertante for 12 strings. And uh, I really liked this, actually. I thought it was quite good. Um, there were there was a lot of contrast in the string te textures. I think um, a lot of the... Um, the, there were a lot of solos in it too. A lot of the uh, string players got a solo. It, it, it sort of went it went ahead like a a baroque work, like a concerto grosso. We have the full orchestra playing, and then like a smaller ensemble from that orchestra will get a, a like a chance to show their stuff, and then the uh, the uh, ritornello will come back, and you'll hear the that theme again. Something like that was happening. There was no ritornello, but I mean th th those textures kept varying. I rather enjoyed that. And then um, between these bigger pieces, there there would be this little kind of uh, very short piece by, um, in this case, uh, Gyurgi Kurtag, um, from his ongoing game signs and messages. Um, this is a this is a piece that he's been writing, I guess, since the 1980s, and it's uh, still going on. He's still writing new little pieces for it. Uh, next came the uh, the rhythmic barbarity. Of Alberto Hinastera, um, he's an Argentinian composer, uh, Concerto per, per Corde. Now, I like Hinastera's music a lot. Uh, this piece didn't really do much for me, though, um, d despite the uh, caliber of the soloists. Um, I don't know. I, th I thought that was okay. All right. Next uh, was a sh was um, one of the uh, 44 uh, duos for two violins by Bela Bartok. This is one of the later, more difficult ones, Duo Pizzicato. Very enjoyable. And then there's a uh, Ligeti, Gyurgi Ligeti, another Hungarian composer, um, late 20th century, an, a duo by him. And then came uh, the work by Francisco Cole. Now, here's where, for me, the, the, the problems really start. Okay, now he's the conductor. And I had heard one piece by him before, and so so has Russ, in fact. Uh, he, One of his pieces, his uh, guitar, I guess it's a guitar concerto. That's right, we listened to that a few weeks ago. Yeah, it was featured on uh, 
an album with uh, Rodrigo's very famous Concierto de Aranjuez. Right. I said that right. Which was um, a nice, which was a nice performance. Beautiful. Uh, it was by uh, Jakob Kellerman. Yes, Kellerman. Okay. And then this, the cold piece after that was sort of a. It was another a, guitar. It was called Toria, actually. And right. I've got it in front of me now. Um, and uh, the the. I guess it was okay, but the problem was the programming. You have this right. beloved work like the Rodrigo, and then uh, Cole's piece came next, and it's very you know, 20th century modernist, and it didn't, it, you know, it didn't, it, it, it you know, it, it, it had like a post-war quality to it where everything was sort of disjointed. There were a lot of like uh, sonor you know, odd sonorities and things like that, which are usually interesting, but um, it, it didn't play well after that work so i was kind of hoping for something better here and we kind of got it um the uh he's his um his whole sound seems to fit this uh string texture better okay um his piece on this um album was called le plaisir illumine which is the name of the album and so this is really the centerpiece of the of the disc he's conducting his own work and again i my whole it's not bad, actually. I liked it a lot better than the uh, the guitar work, but I feel like this guy's whole idiom. He's he's really stuck in the post-war era. Now you could say we're still in that, but I feel like music has changed since um, the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, just the the whole tone of music changed, like tonality came back, not quite in the same way, but um, the the avant garde of that era. It was pretty much done, you know, by the end of the 20th century. And he, he's really still in that, and I'm not really feeling it. So I didn't really think much of that. Okay, so there's that piece, Le Plaisir Illumine. And if the album had ended there, it would have been pretty good. But then we get another Francisco Cole work called uh, La Lula Lead. And this was like where this. I thought that, um, <laughs> you know, down the road from me, there's a mental institution by this oh, creepy God. lake. And I've heard similar <laughs> sounds when I've um, passed through there. Um, okay. Now, in this piece, the uh, the string players are playing and they're also shouting or making, they're vocalizing would be the word. Okay. So they're kind of shouting these um, non, these, these sounds without meaning. Okay. And this was kind of like a, this this is what I mean by being stuck in the 20th century. Like after the war, there are these kind of um, attempts to come up with uh, new ways to vocalize or you know new kind of things you know to do with the voice. And this was one of them. And it it really didn't go too far. I mean, how much are you going to do with it? There are people who really um, broke some amazing ground in uh, vocal music in the um, 20th century. I think of Meredith Monk. I like her music a lot. Okay, but this one, it just feels like a throwback, and uh, it was just hard to listen to. I didn't like it at all. Okay, it's called La Lula Lead, listen to that. And then the last track on their album was uh, the uh, Camarada, the um, the ensemble, improvising bird sounds, which was, it was pleasant, it was light, it was kind of like, you know. To me, that was you... one of the more coherent and <laughs> uh, tracks on this whole album. <laughs> Okay, I, I thought this. Um, I don't know. I thought I think I thought it was better than you. I liked the Veres piece a lot. Okay, the very opening one. Um, I think the uh, the bird improvisation is supposed to balance the La Lula lead. You know, you hear all that shouting, the ha, yes. ah, ah, and then you hear the um, the the bird sounds, and it's, I think it's supposed to sort of be like a companion to that. Um, I don't really think it worked very well, though. I did. I thought the La Lula lead was not enjoyable. Anyway. Well, Sorry, this was a this was a tough cold, listen, but that's just the way I feel. This was a tough <laughs> listen for me. Um, you know, whenever uh, Kurtog, Bartok, and Ligeti are a melodic interlude to some other pieces, <laughs> then you know you're. I'm sort of. Uh, in out of my depth. Um, Let's just say you shouldn't be listening to this when you wake up in the morning. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no. I did, but the uh, the the Hysteria Concerto for Strings. I did find some sort of interesting things to follow along yeah. uh, in that piece, but the rest and uh, Cole now having listened to uh, the other album for guitar in this. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready for any more. Uh, I'll yeah. need some more palate cleansing before I can uh, dive into this again. 
By the way, most people will have heard of the composer Hina, Alberto Hinastera from uh, an Emerson Lincoln Palmer, because uh, Keith Emerson played a movement from the Toccata movement from his uh, piano concerto. Right, and he on pops up again own. later on today's yeah. program too. Who does Keith Emerson? Oh, yes, that's right. Hinastera does. No, Emerson. Emerson does. Yes. Okay. All right, and um, yeah, Hinastera. If you want to hear a great Hinastera work, listen to his harp concerto. It's really great. It's not a pretty work, though it does have pretty passages. I guess the harp can't really help but be pretty. But he wanted to write an aggressive um, um, composition for harp. And uh, it's got really appealing melodies. It's exciting. It's a really good work. And it's great on recordings because if you get to hear this uh, this piece live, usually the, or the very loud and rhythmically pro propulsive orchestra drowns out the harp, but you can mic you can fix that with uh, mic techniques in the in a recording. So uh, get, try to hear that the harp concerto. Okay, any recording well, is going to be check okay. That one I think. Out. Yeah, yeah, it's really um, good. Okay. Yeah, Cole for me for now is. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to listen to something else instead. I think. Yeah. yeah this he, was he's a tough a young one. Guy. He's born in Yeah, I see that. 85. So. He, he's got he's got a lot of years ahead of him. So, yes. You know. Okay. We'll see. He'll maybe maybe he'll become our favorite composer in twenty years. Well, depends where he goes. Okay. All right. So our last uh, we we we're pretty classical heavy today, and our last um, album is a, a Naxos release. Okay. Um, another duo. Another duo. This is the Mare duo, and I got to say something about them. First of all, they are uh, they're husband uh, and wife group, are they not? Are they? I guess they are. I, I have been are. trying to uh, confirm that. They are somehow related. Uh, so I'm guessing husband and wife just from could the Could be brother and sister. Seem, I don't know. Yeah, not They could be, but they, they seem a little too uh, uh, close to each other in the photos to be brother and sister. Although you never know. You know, it's kind of saying. Annika Hinsche and Fabian Hinsche. Okay, they're both, I, I'm going to guess, German. Uh, and they're called Mare Duo. Now, Mare means the sea, of course, like the Mediterranean Sea. And... Um, the um, ensemble photo or the duo photo of them has the both of them playing their instruments at the bottom of sitting on chairs at the bottom of a swimming pool that's filled. They're underwater. That's as in close the photo. as you can get in Germany, right? Or I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but you, but this is quite. This is one of those photos where you just say it's it's funny. It's it's a funny photo, but uh, classical musicians are really bad at being cool. <laughs> It's 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 really hard. I guess it's just not. It's it's um it's music I love, but I don't know. How, I don't know that it's cool. You know. That said, think, that said, yeah. this mm -hmm. is a very enjoyable uh, recording. I really well, like this one. Yeah, let's go into the music. Okay, Carlo Domeniconi, Italian composer. Now, I learned about him years ago when the Australian guitarist John Williams, not to be confused with the composer of Star Wars, who is a different person. And not Australian. Star Wars music, yeah. Uh, John Williams uh, played the um, played a piece by uh, Domeniconi called Koyum Baba, which is his most famous solo guitar work. Domeniconi himself is a guitarist, and he writes um, almost exclusively, really, for the guitar. I haven't really heard much music that didn't feature a guitar by him. Okay, and it's it's a great piece. You should really seek that out. Okay, and that really made me interested in hearing more by this composer. Now, Koyun Baba is based on Turkish themes, and it seems like Domeniconi really uh, makes the rounds as far as um, European and uh, Asia. I found Asian, that too. I guess, West Asian, you know, history goes. In the pieces on this uh, recording, uh, what is it? We have the uh, uh, Dorondarte mm -hmm. and uh, the other piece also. I You feel... You can sense the uh, respect for the Spanish guitar tradition uh, mm -hmm. that you hear, but you can also hear uh, more Eastern elements of music right. brought in. And it sounds uh, also uh, very, how should I say, uh, in the classical guitar tradition, but also very modern at times. The balance of the elements is very intriguing. Um, you can hear um, you know various uh, influences in the music, but it, it's it's very easy to listen to as well. Yeah, this is a good record. It's really yeah. it's contemporary music that's very listenable. It's got a sweetness of tone to it. Um, the two uh, instruments kind of um, uh, 
and it gets better as you go on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm used to listening to uh, mandolin and guitar together in sort of folk music uh, yeah. and some interesting mm -hmm. collaborations by, you know, virtuosos in root, roots music and things. So I know that the tonalities and the sort of interplay will work. But at the very beginning, I wasn't so sure um, <clears throat> in the uh, Durandarte piece. I thought, oh, is this going to work? But as it goes on, it gets, just gets better and better. And um, by the middle of the recording to the end, I was really locked in and thinking, oh, this is this is really nice. Uh, yeah. the, the interplay, uh, the way that uh, this duo plays together, and then the different directions that the compositions go. Um, it had me really intrigued. So I've, I've listened to this a few times already. And yeah, um, I, yeah it gets better each time. I find more... Uh, interesting little things I didn't notice uh, in previous listenings. Yeah, that's an important point. When I first put this on, I was like, oh, wow, this sounds kind of like cluttered to me, but it really wasn't. Um, it, it it went on and the the works got um, slower and more spacious. Uh, the Durandarte, this piece is based on a medieval romantic story, so the lovers get closer, so the, the music gets gentler as it goes, and then at the end, it kind of it ends badly, <laughs> let's say, for our hero. But... Yes. Um, um, I went back, I've heard this a few times too, and um, what sort of put me off at the beginning didn't put me off when I heard it. I think it just, um, I just had to get used to the sound, really. It was a little, it wasn't what I expected. And you, when you listen to music and it's not the way you expect it to be, you go with a, a preconception and it's not like that, you tend not to like it right away. But you always have to go to an, with an, to music with an open mind, of course. I still... You know, we'll oh, sure. kind of not do I that. I also felt, um, not knowing his other works so well, um, I wasn't really, uh, I, did, I didn't know how to adjust to his uh, composition style. So yeah. I didn't really know what I was listening for next and sort of the the arching of the themes and where, you know, where the directions were going in the different movements. But um, by the time mm -hmm. I got to the, through the uh, first piece, and then uh, what's the third selection? The uh, Temple Music? Yeah. The, that I also enjoyed a lot. And by that time I was at that part, I was really into uh, the direction. So I was along for the ride of the different movements. And at that point I was locked in and thought, oh, this really works well. Um, yeah. And I, I thought it's interesting since mostly, well, he is a guitarist and composes for the guitar, and then he really, uh, yeah, I, I understand that yeah. he wrote he wrote these pieces specifically for uh, this uh, duo of right. performers, and and so I could understand that and how he, you know, utilized the the uniqueness of the mandolin, and you know, sort of supported and expanded on what the guitar can do with that, and uh, yeah, it's it's very. Uh, it's it's very nice to listen to and uh, intriguing. So yeah, I want to give a, a few more notes on some of the other pieces on here. the the tenth The tenth track is called um, Le Città e gli Occhi Zembrade Zemrude. Sorry, Zemrude is the name of a um, an imaginary city in Italo Calvino's book Invisible Cities, and uh, that's sort of what he's uh, evoking here. This this city that changes its appearance. Um, depending on your mood. So if you're in a good mood, it's a bright, colorful, joyous place. And if you're in a bad mood, it's suddenly this gray, horrible place. And he's trying to evoke that in Sounds the music. Sounds like where we live. Uh, I guess, <laughs> yeah, Japan is a bit like that. Japanese poets praise, especially Kyoto poets from back in the day, praise the the rain in Japan. They love rainy days. And I really don't. I just can't relate to those to those poems. You no, know? no, especially in uh, June and yeah. July. But yeah, it, oh, and, and then it gets very hot, and you, yes. you know, the, the two of the great uh, Japanese filmmakers, Kurosawa, uh, is one of them. And in his movies, it's always raining. I just want you to notice this. And the other one is uh, Ozu Yasujiro Ozu, and in his movies, it's always this hot, sunny day. You always see people fanning themselves and yes. things like that. So those, that's really. Those two together really are Japan. The weather in Japan, right there, these horrible rainy days. Actually, it's never horrible. It just rains and it just feels depressing. I don't know. They they get all poetic about it, but I I don't know. They you know I think Japanese people are closer to nature than I am. 
Okay. Uh, by the way, the last work on this disc is called um, Tarantula Precox. Yes. Um, the tarantula that I grew up to soon. And it is, in tr true Italian fashion, a tarantella. Um, so it's his take on the tarantella dance, which comes from yeah. Napoli, from Naples. Um, by the way, the story behind the uh, tarantella is very interesting. Um, the, the word kind of comes from the tarantula, the spider. And it was said that if you get a spider bite from a tarantula, you can uh, do this vigorous dance and it would uh, kind of, you'd sweat the poison out. And uh, the dance came known as the tarantella because it was the tarantula bite dance that cured <laughs> you from it. So there you go. You can hear that too. All right. Done with classical music, it looks like. All right. On to, on jazz. to, on to the jazz selections. Yes. And, well, <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, normally, I wouldn't uh, probably choose to have a recording by the same artist in two consecutive episodes. However, uh, since this artist has put out two recordings at almost yeah. the same time, and they both happen to be uh, very nice, uh, we thought, why not? Uh, let's go with it. Uh, last week, we yeah, talked we about... we did mention it, too. Yeah. We did mention it. Uh, yeah. But uh, in the last episode, we... Uh, talked about the Bill Evans tribute by uh, Enrico Pieranunzi, yes. uh, the Italian pianist, uh, which was a very nice recording. And yeah, I loved it. I'm still it's, listening. It's nice. And I mean, Bill Evans is uh, clearly one of his big uh, influences. And then it shows through in that recording. Uh, he uses a lot of uh, Bill Evans uh, sort of lines and uh, mm -hmm. structures and um even in his original compositions and that was a duo with uh, bass uh, and so almost at the same time he's released this uh, other uh, duo album called uh, Afterglow and this is with uh, the Belgian trumpeter uh, Bert uh, Joris I think we decided yeah. is the pronunciation it could be yeah, Joris we, we yeah Joris, could be Joris. Yeah. spelled with uh, a J <laughs> but it's on uh, Challenge Records, and so mm -hmm. we've just got uh, piano and trumpet. And um, I, I suppose in my jazz collection, I have, uh, you know, all, all different types of recordings. And I, and I do have uh, a fair number of uh, just piano and then wind instrument recordings. So some of my favorites are, um, uh, I guess, uh, Art Pepper and uh, George Cables uh, mm. released a few uh, just piano and saxophone recordings. And uh, it's kind of interesting when you start to remove uh, elements that are part of, say, you know, a jazz uh, quartet or quintet. So when you take, when you take out the drums, uh, not that I have anything against uh, drums, uh, everyone loves mm. drums, but it's interesting, you don't have that constant wash of the cymbal there and of course uh now you're taking out the main rhythmic element right so now the pian pianist has to be the complete rhythm section and then when you also remove the bass uh so the duty of holding down the low end and uh putting that bottom harmonic structure also goes to the pianist but it also results in a lot of freedom and mm. uh, so those kind of recordings uh, can be kind of interesting and they tend to, you know, they're more sparse in nature. So you can focus on just the two instruments. And coming from the Bill Evans tribute, uh, here his influence uh, of Bill Evans is much less noticeable. He's really, so too. Yeah. he's really into his own voice here. And the nice thing about uh, this album is it's all original music. Uh, so the compositions are pretty well. I think Pierre Nunzi has uh, a few more. Uh, Yoris, one, two, three, four, has four uh, original uh, pieces. And uh, the rest of the tracks are Pierre Nunzi. And the overall um, feeling of the disc uh, of this recording is uh, kind of very joyful and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, uplifting uh, mood overall, uh, yeah, but that's a beat album. It's yeah. upbeat, but within that, uh, there, there's a various uh, moods that it evokes. Uh, there are a few ballads. Uh, there's a few sort of uh, swinging, um, upbeat, very major type melodies, and also there are a couple tunes that are 
very modern and adventurous where the uh, improvisations are outside the chord structure and uh, experimenting with different things. So I thought there's a lot of variety uh, within that sort of upbeat and uplifting mood. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't familiar with uh, yours's name, uh, but he is uh, a major player in Europe and has uh, played with a lot of uh, uh, famous ensembles and other people, and he's a uh, an excellent player. He his technique is great. Uh, he has a very nice sound. It's um, I find his sound was warm, but not excessively dark, which seems to be sort of a trend in a lot of uh, modern trumpet players uh, that are getting this really dark sound. Now he has a nice balanced tone. It's very uh, sort of uh, honest sounding. Uh, mm. He's never hiding. Uh, behind any sort of uh, sort of uh, cliches or anything, I felt it's always fresh and to the point. And the original compositions sort of highlight that. And it, the the balance of the piano and and trumpet solos and interplay are just right. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really nice fresh recording, and that's why I thought, oh, we should mention this too. Um, that uh, Pio Nunzi has put these both out at the same time, two different duos. Uh, one with bass, one with trumpet. Yeah, what a fabulous player this guy is. Yeah, there's a th there's a little difference though. Um, Pierre Nunzi in on the um, the Bill Evans tribute album. Pierre Nunzi is without a doubt the lead um, player, and with the with the bass. Well, the bass isn't really accompanying, but he he's sort of a he's a he's a partner. But you're right. really focusing on the piano on that record. In this case, the trumpet being a melodic instrument. Um, Pierre Nunzi gets the um, the lead billing. It says Enrico Pierre Nunzi and Bert. Yoris on the cover, but I feel like Yoris is really the uh, the main attraction here. Where he's with playing the, the head melodies more, and um, yeah, yeah. yeah but also, uh, Piranunzi is he's not as um, he he doesn't have the presence he had on the other album. He kind of takes he's much more accompanist ro accompanist. Yeah, role he's here, much yes. more in the accompanist role yes. on this album. Yeah, I agree. so I kind of don't think of this as a as a Piranunzi album, although you know. I, well, I, I guess do, he's, you know what I mean, but, he's yeah. a bigger name, so he's got the front billing. Yeah, but you're right. right. It's much more. Uh, it's much uh, more of a balance with often yours in the uh, in the spotlight here, which was yeah. nice because I got to uh, you know hear a lot of uh, another trumpet player that I wasn't so familiar with, which just lets you know that there's great players out there in every country, uh, as good as anywhere else and so yeah i'm going to explore more of yours's recordings uh, yeah and we should remind yeah. you that is russ's instrument the trumpet or one of, one of them, many yes. but the main Which you one. hear on the adult yeah. music theme I, I dusted off the trumpet and harmon mute uh, <laughs> which hadn't um, been practiced in a while actually yeah mm -hmm. writing that you know um uh, in the past recent mm -hmm. years most of the writing of songs and music i've done has been on a guitar and uh, so when you write something, whether guitar based compared to keyboard based, it's a different, it's a completely different way of approaching um, something. And uh, you'll tend to go in different directions and see things uh, quite differently. Um, yeah, so th this time looking on a keyboard, I got different harmonic ideas. Uh, and actually, when I decided the, the little bit of the melody, I worked that out on the keyboard first and then just transposed it uh, into the trumpet. So uh, I think even if you, you know, if you can play multiple instruments, you'll be influenced in the direction that your mind will go based on, you know, the facility and the sort of um, the technical aspects of that instrument. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just an idea. Uh, that's yeah. why it's nice to know about different instruments. Yeah. Right. Okay. So enjoyable album, and we are on to. Yes. Now the one I've been waiting for. Yes, this uh, is Russ's one of Russ's I, favorite. Artists. I wanted to have one more jazz album to talk about, but I hadn't seen anything come out, and then this popped into the new releases, and this is by one of my favorite, and I think uh, one of the most exciting and best pianists on the jazz scene today is Mr. David Kikoski. Yes. And uh, so I've been listening to Dave Kikoski for, oh, more than 30 years, I guess. Um, I, I came across him first uh, when I was a trumpet player in high school, uh, uh, one of the players who I respected and emulated was Randy Brecker, uh, mm -hmm. who, of course, um, 
uh, the great Randy Brecker, Brecker, yes. the uh, Brecker brothers. But mm. uh, from time to time, uh, Randy Brecker has recorded some more real traditional jazz uh, albums. And in the 80s, he re had two releases. One was uh, Live at Sweet Basil's, and the other was called uh, In the Idiom. And uh, they both featured Dave Kokoski on piano as a sideman. And that's, uh, that's how I knew his name. And my first year of university, I was in the uh, dormitory. And uh, I think I had, I had a f roommate who I had nothing in common with. And I made another friend who was a jazz drummer, actually. And um, so we switched. And, uh, you know, we th I thought, oh, I'll have a roommate with someone something to talk about. So I threw on some, uh, this Brecker album. I was listening. He's like, oh, this is good. Uh, what is this? I was like, this is Brecker. And uh, on piano here is uh, Dave Kokoski. He's like, wait, Dave Kokoski, uh, the pianist? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I played in a band with him, you know, a couple months ago. So my uh, roommate um, wow. had had played in a band. They did a lot of wedding gigs. So I guess as when Kukoski was sort of, you know, uh, still coming up as a sideman, he was taking gigs. And uh, my roommate said, I, he was a, a blast, a really um, interesting guy uh, and fun to play with. So, um, yeah, so he's come a long way as from a sideman and then a lot of uh, great recordings uh, with his own trio and uh, what's his other group? Uh, uh, Pentasonic, I think, uh, is a group he plays with the great uh, Russian-born uh, trumpeter. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of his name now. It's escaping me. Um, Alex Sipiagin, a fabulous mm. player. Uh, hopefully I can talk about one of his releases. And uh, also on last year's uh, tribute to Charlie Parker, uh, Bird at 100, with... Um, Let's see, Gary Bartz and uh, two other alto players, uh, one of whom has got an album coming out soon. And that also features uh, uh, Dave Kikoski. And so mm -hmm. Dave Kikoski has um, a massive uh, keyboard technique, uh, and he can do everything. He plays huge, blocky chords. Uh, his solos are very intense with uh, wonderful running lines, and uh, he also makes his own interesting compositions. And so this is an uh, interesting uh, recording. It's called Sure Thing, and it's another duo uh, yeah, with piano and today. bass. Yeah, with the uh, Russian-born, and now I assume uh, New York-based, uh, Boris Kozlov on bass. And it's on uh, High Note Records. And uh, this is uh, actually uh, an interesting point about this album. So when I found it, uh, I was just uh, so happy to have a new Kikoski recording. So I put it on. And, uh, you know, I let it play in the background without looking at the track information. And I was listening through, seeing if I could identify any of the uh, compositions. And um, so nothing familiar started. And then I thought I recognized a couple uh, tunes. And uh, then I knew later that, oh, there's a couple standards on here. But when I went back and looked, uh, I was quite surprised. And so what we've got here is uh, a few originals. The first two tunes on the disc are uh, Kikoski originals. There's a B-flat tune and then a song just called E. Yeah, <laughs> and very, uh, very classical type names, you know? Yes. <laughs> and then the third is actually, as we mentioned before, um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer is uh, Keith Emerson's uh, fugue from The Endless Enigma. Um, yeah, Keith so, Emerson. So this is how that comes yeah, in. Yeah, I should yeah. also mention that uh, Kikoski was a member of a group called uh, Beatle Jazz, uh, who recorded a few albums of uh, Beatle tunes with reharmonizations and uh, really interesting arrangements. Um, so he's obviously uh, a fan of Beatles music and other music. So uh, taking this Keith Emerson piece in was also interesting. And there's also a, a Chick Corea. Uh, piece yeah. uh, quartet number one, and now the the one that really threw me that was really interesting was uh, this song. Uh, so it's credited as uh, to John Coltrane, uh, "Satellite." Now, um, it, "Satellite" uh, is actually uh, what's known as a contrafact. So uh, this word uh, for <laughs> people, uh, you musical scholars, uh, originally comes from classical music, but it's basically a composition that's based on a pre-existing composition. So borrowing the uh, harmonic structure and song structure and writing a new mm. melody and other pieces on it. Um, and it hadn't been applied to uh, non-classical music until uh, in jazz from bebop and beyond. So I guess you could say other than the 12-bar blues that... Uh, 
you know, probably the greatest number of uh, jazz pieces written on a structure would be uh, rhythm changes. So uh, Gershwin's I Got Rhythm, you know, probably up to maybe you know, 20 to 30 some percent of songs are based on that structure. So you could say that's the original contrafact. Um, but there's a lot of other songs that are like that. So the, the kind of uh, funny point about this is that uh, uh, Coltrane wrote this uh, uh, contrafact satellite. And um, when you listen to this, uh, you'll think, oh, uh, you know, I, I know this tune. Um, and then, but when uh, Kikowski plays it, he goes back and he plays the original uh, melody of the song, uh, which is not a contrafact at all. <laughs> so no. it's sort of like he's putting a little inside joke here or something and uh, going back uh and just playing the original composition, but then crediting to a uh, Coltrane. Because if you listen to Coltrane's version, he starts into his uh, improvisations as soon as the song starts. And if you're familiar with the um, the harmonic structure, you'll know what he's doing. But uh, I'll leave the tune up to your own uh, imagination uh, for jazz fans, and then you'll you'll sit and you'll wonder, well, why did he uh, list it as that? Uh, maybe just to get your attention, but it got my attention at that, and. Um, then after that, there is another uh, standard the uh, from uh, the title of I'm Sure Thing, which is uh, uh, Kern and Gershwin. And then it ends mm. with a uh, another Kikoski. That's, that's Ira Gershwin, the lyricist, not George Gershwin. Right, I Ira Gershwin. Kern, yeah. Kern is the, uh, the composer of the music. Yeah, Jerome Kern is the composer. And then there's another uh, Kikoski uh, original. So uh, I think this showcases uh, Kikoski's playing a lot because, again, we've got no drummer here. So he's uh, really uh, doing a lot of uh, interesting... Uh, um rhythmic things and the bass the interplay with the bass uh this uh, uh Kozlov is uh, a really fine bassist and they're locking in with uh you know overlaying rhythmic structures and uh Kikoski can really stretch out there's a there's a few uh nice ballad solos and then uh there's a few pieces where his uh, really dense blocky chords and are contrasted with his real running uh you know solo lines and uh I, he's just to me he he's right up there with anyone else uh in jazz piano today and he just should be uh he should be better known he should be a household name as far as i'm concerned yeah but, he's he's got a huge range of, yeah, uh, yeah he's yeah he's somebody one of the i can't remember which now first of all i'm learning a lot of what russ is saying uh for the first time now because i again i heard this on deezer and they didn't mention who the the uh the uh, songwriters and composers were. So I didn't oh, realize okay. that this was Keith Emerson. <laughs> you know? and yeah, I, yeah. Think I was surprised too, because yeah. I didn't recognize it. Um, I, I had heard the yeah. Emerson uh, piece, but then, um, you know, I was surprised when I looked at it. I said, oh, that's what that is. And, yeah, um, that, that happens to me a lot when listening to jazz. I'm like, yeah, I know this, but I, you know, then I got to look at the, uh, look it up on the internet somewhere, or maybe look on the uh, CD case and find out who the uh, songwriter is. Right. Um, for me, though, one of the things I noticed about Kikoski, another thing he does is um, something that, except that he does this in a jazz idiom, he's really amazing at um, building new melodies from his previous melodies. It's, it's really incredible when he's really on. Right. Um, he can just keep going. And I can't remember which track that was. I'm thinking it's Strength for Change. Uh, the two... The two tracks on this album that stood out for me, it was all really good, were two the two Kikoski uh, compositions, Strength for Change, because of his the, these chains of melodies that he was building, right. like one would lead to another. It was just fantastic. And I really love the uh, the send-off there, Winnie's Garden, the very last yes. um, the one. It, it, it has an exciting beginning, this this big kind of like um, maybe early 20th century, you know, rhythmic profile to it, the jazz piano from the early, uh, yes. from the early 20th century. And then it kind of goes off from there in some unexpected directions. Very enjoyable and very exciting. I liked it a lot. I'm glad you liked this one. Yeah. And of course, yeah, I, I, I was alluding to it, but satellite is uh, how high the moon, right? The satellite. Uh, okay. um, so what you can hear, if you listen to that track, it's, it's very obvious that it's how high the moon, cause he plays it, but he reharmonizes, uh, along with the original melody. So, he, you know, you can hear him taking a structure that most people know and then, you know, how he's going to sort of, uh, you know, extract and then redevelop uh, different parts of it. He, his 
very advanced harmonically and uh yeah. yeah he's he's just really exciting to listen to um never fails to uh uh be great to get one of his new performances so yeah um, and if and he's fun to watch too if you, there's some uh, recordings of uh him in uh, different venues on youtube and uh, it's very intense someday someday after corona uh <laughs> then uh, i hope to get a chance to uh to see when's him. that oh, gonna him? be like 2022 sometime who or? knows yeah i'm waiting because oh, you know he does he has uh, the um bird at 100 recording was on smoke sessions and mm. they're having um weekly uh online performances uh ho however they don't give much notice only a couple days maybe they're just working sort of uh, ad hoc at who they can get in uh, and it's uh ten dollars uh, to watch uh, one of these concerts online uh i'm i'm hoping that maybe uh Kikoski will show up for uh, one of these sessions and it's well worth my ten dollars to uh, catch something spontaneous uh, almost live over the internet so yeah missing those um live or live performances you know that's musicians right. traveling all over the world getting to see them yes. a lot of them are performing on the internet though so maybe yeah. we can catch something there so you can catch something yeah hmm. um but uh yeah so that was uh a nice uh a nice new find there and so i recommend uh yeah any of uh, kikowski's work his own trio uh, he's got one uh, a, a few years ago that's a very uh, excellent album with Christian McBride, too. So if you went here to uh, Masters together, uh, that's an excellent, excellent recording. And then um, yeah, with his own trio, there's a live date, too. Uh, what's the one with um, Christian McBride, too? Oh, I think that's, uh, yes, uh, Consequences. That's with uh, Christian McBride yeah. and uh, Jeff Watts on drums. Uh, very okay. famous and well-known uh, uh, drummer. So that's a great one. And uh, I think his most recent one was uh, K-Mode. I think that's also on high note. And then uh, with um, uh, a larger ensemble, uh, Pentasonic group, uh, Opus 5, uh, that's with uh, Seamus Blake, uh, Alex Sipiagin, also Boris Kozlov, and uh, Donald Edwards uh, for a larger ensemble. But uh, yeah, any any group he's in uh, is going to be uh, really interesting. And drawing from, you know, uh, numerous... Um, songs you know not only standards but originals and then he pulls in uh i think yeah what was the one i think uh I let, didn't i let you borrow this last one on uh k mode uh he does um what does he have in there is it k mode was it was it a smoke section sessions one or uh no but he does a a jazz version of uh wichita lineman uh, I remember right. so, this. This is from yeah. a few years back. A few years back, now. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. he's always okay. pulling in something that's not jazzy and making it, uh, you know, into jazz. So, uh, yeah, I, I like that songs. about him. Yeah, he can so see like he that. can see possibilities inside of pop songs that are very inventive. So, and we could see possibilities too. Cause yes, I think we're going to need to going into the future. So, yes, this is will. the music you want to be listening to. That's right. And it'll it'll inspire you. Okay. So those are our six selections for this week. And uh, what's next? I think we're going to uh, research these Grammy nominations. And that, uh, that might be, yeah, that's coming up. Uh, March 14th is the uh, Grammy Award. So we're going to have to get that pretty soon. We only have uh, three weeks to A do it. Three weeks, that's we, right. I think we're going to, we'll probably do like one dedicated to all the jazz um, nominees. We should split them up, yeah. Yeah, and, do, and then another one for the class because that's, there are eight, categories in classical and to be honest um i, I intend to listen to all, i've heard most of the jazz uh, ones already but the class yeah uh, i'll explain this when we actually get to it but uh, i have like kind of a, a funny thing about the classical grammys which i'll discuss more and i have a funny thing the about the episode. jazz ones too i'm sure uh, you do yeah. yes <laughs> especially about certain there's, trumpet there's, players there's a lot uh, to say so. about the grammys yes. but they you know there are some good picks in there and we'll we'll highlight those this year is, give, is better than last year i would say so I you think I, don't I won't know. be too um, curmudgeon about? Uh, yeah, I got. Yes. I got to say, I don't think I'm going to listen to. I mean, I'll listen to like a lot of the classical ones, but I don't think I'm going to listen to all the operas. That's going to drive me crazy. It's like three hours each, <laughs> but I'll, I'll sample them all. We'll see. We'll see how they. Uh, 
how they we'll, go. Yeah, we'll uh, make appropriate choices. And uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's make an episode for the classical and then uh, for the jazz uh, separately. Okay. So the next one, I guess, is going to be um, for the jazz Grammys. That'll be the... Yeah, let's do that the, next. Yeah, that, that one will take less preparation at the moment. Yeah, I'm going to have to start next. from nothing from the classical ones. i got to see what they are, actually. Yeah. Okay. And that's right. it. That'll be all for today, then. That'll Thanks be for joining all for us, everyone. episode two of adult music. And remember, in addition to adult music, extreme music would be an, a wonderful addition to your life. So check out the link in to the uh, Amazon book yes, uh, please, in the description please read my below. Book. And yeah. uh, support Mike's writing efforts because uh, I've heard rumors on the circuit that uh, Extreme Music 2 may be in the works. No, so. well, there is a second book in the works, but it's not about music. It's a novel, but it, it, oh. there won't be music in this one. Oh. Although music gets mentioned, I guess, once or twice. Sure it's you about, it's it. about college students, this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, but not modern day college students. They're kind of college students back in the 90s, I think, or 80s. I was in college in the 80s, but it's not really about me. I don't know. It's always a little about you, though. A little but, bit. Right. Yeah. Right. Anyway, looking forward to the Jazz Grammy nominees in the next mm -hmm. episode of Adult Music. So until then, keep listening, and we'll be back again soon. Mm -hmm.